Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is Philip Watley. So sit back. Pop a cold one. And dive into some books. And brew. Do you want to say right now. So welcome everybody to episode 25 yep. of Books and Brews podcast. Episode big 25. That's the what? Mm-hmm. Solar anniversary? Solar. Uh, I think it is. And um, speaking of anniversaries, as long as you brought it up, it's really cool that we have a romance writer with us today because I'm celebrating two months today of marriage. <laughs> Congratulations. And, right, right. You see, he feeds me too well, so therefore I have to wear it on my pinky until um, I start refusing all the good food and drink. <laughs> <laughs> And today beer, um, and then it'll fit on the finger it is supposed to fit on again. But um, yeah, so, so it's kind of appropriate that we have you today. So, yeah. <laughs> how's month been, Michael? Uh, it's been same old, same old. Uh, but I did have kind of a banjo epiphany, if you will. What, what was that? Uh, I realized that all this time I have been learning the wrong style of banjo playing. You're uh, so there are way, many different styles of banjo playing. Um, I have been learning three finger picking bluegrass style, mm-hmm. which I love, and that's great. And I'll keep learning it. But I realized I was listening to and watching videos of all the sort of old timey Appalachian musicians that 30 mm-hmm. years ago made me first think I want to learn how to play the banjo. Yeah, um, and they are playing two finger thumb lead primarily. So it's instead of two fingers picking, you're using just your thumb and your forefinger mm-hmm. and your thumb plays all of the lead. So how does that affect say the way the music sounds or what chords or what style, like um, patterns of chords is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, so it affects it a lot. So with the, the three finger bluegrass, you know, all banjo has a lot of extra notes. There's just a whole lot of ornamentation. Mm-hmm. Um, so with three finger, there's a lot more of that because your three fingers mm-hmm. are just going all the time. Um, with the two finger, basically your thumb is playing all the lead and sometimes uh, the fifth string drone note and your forefinger is only playing the first string drone note. Okay. So that's like every upbeat is a is that first string drone. Well, and I think you know that I've got. Um, I, I figure I had forty five to fifty instruments of my own, and now that you know I moved in with another musician, I figure we have to have sixty or seventy five at least in this house. Probably more than that. We've got. Like, um, in fact, <laughs> I'm looking at Melanie's office here. Uh, we probably have almost as many instruments as you have Star Wars memorabilia. <laughs> um, That's got, amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got three harps. We have a grand piano upstairs and a grand piano downstairs. So it's, it's kind of like uh, the fiddler on the roof, you know, one stair- oh, wow. staircase just, just- going down. I'm just picturing the three harps because one of my friends, her daughters plays harp and they're oh. huge. Well, it depends. And see, this is the reason harpists end up with multiple harps. I've got the the big one. Um, it's not a pedal harp, but it's as big as one. Then I've got my medium harp, which I play the most. And then I have a little uh, lap laptop harp, lap harp it's called, and that has wire strings. So in fact, Michael, it's kind of like what you were saying about banjo, that there are all these different styles. You know, there are wire string harps. There are the Goddard nylon string harps. Um, lever harps, pedal harps, they're just, you You could have a stable full of harps yeah. and play each one. So, but I was going to say banjo for all these instruments. Banjo is one that I don't actually know a whole lot about. The other thing about the two-finger, old-fashioned two-finger style is it's played without picks. Okay. Although I found I play it with picks because I learned to play with picks and it's easier. It's hard to adjust. Yeah, see, I learned to play guitar and I'm really, really bad at guitar. But when I do play it, (laughs) I play it just with fingers. I never use a pick. 
and I, I can't adjust to that because I never did it to begin with. So, but um, yeah, my, my month, you know, I'm, I'm back to not that exciting. I just been settling in. I've been organizing. I've been packing. I've been digging through, oh, just reams and reams and piles and piles of music, but it's kind of exciting. I found pieces I composed years ago that I knew I was missing. I couldn't find anywhere. And I finally found like, I had this really cool piece I wrote, I think in 2015, and I was on allpoetry.com, which actually is where next month's guest is, uh, she's on allpoetry.com too, so there's kind of a tie in there, but there was this guy there who writes just this phenomenal like saga poetry where he tells these fantastic stories in ballad form, and so he wrote a piece called The Reaper Man, and if he's out there listening, he's got to be, because what are we up to, like, I don't know, 48 million listeners now or something? Please. Oh, he's he's got to be among them. Um, so if he is, contact me. But I set this piece to music, this poem he wrote called The Reaper Man, and Chris and I had actually happened to go to Scotland just after we wrote it. And so I played it outside Hermitage Castle there. And so somewhere, if it's not up on YouTube, I think it already is. Um, but I finally found the music so I can play it on piano now because I didn't remember how it went at all, you know, apart from listening to the flute version. So that's been the, good. The video of you playing this in front of the castle is somewhere on YouTube? Yes, it is. And in fact, now that I think about it, I'm positive because I've got lots and lots of videos up. So what I would do, and this is, you know, one of these things where if we could not like ignore the clock, we could talk for hours because you've been <laughs> too. Um, it's actually at the, the very reason I took this particular research trip was because I had a scene set at Hermitage Castle and I couldn't figure out online where is the castle compared to the graveyard? And there was a man named the Count of Kildeer, I believe is how you pronounce it. And I'm, you know, my history is now, uh, my research is a few years old, but I couldn't figure out where his gravestone was in relation to the castle and the graveyard. So I'm actually playing it in the graveyard, which is like, I don't know, a five minute walk from the castle. And then just in case, anybody's wondering, which I know, I know at least 45 of our 48 million listeners are wondering, the Count of Kildeer's gravestone is outside the graveyard. And I, I think that it was probably one of these, you know, he was declared unfit to be buried on sacred grounds. I, I don't remember if he was a suicide or something like that, or if he had killed a man, but there is probably a reason he's buried outside the grounds, but just like, you know, 18 inches. So he's really close. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating i'm going to definitely look this up and just yeah, yeah okay. me, yes yeah I'll, I'll see if i can send you that link but so i suppose i should introduce our first guest uh okay, what do we got? other <laughs> voice um we we didn't go over what we're reading but um I read anything anyway so you didn't <laughs> i covered you again although i'm only getting through half of each book i've been reading the view from mount joy by lorna landvik which is really interesting and then totally different the man who got even with god which is actually the biography of um the biography of a man who had a horrible temper who ended up becoming a Trappist monk and ended up being renowned for how gentle and patient he was, you know, so just a complete 180 from what he had been. But um, so we, we should have had you in February or it's here in February, but we actually had someone talking about love and uh, love poems in February. So that worked too. Um, today we have with us author Melanie Johnson, AKA The Writing Lush and a USA Today bestselling author. She enjoys cheap wine, expensive beer and sipping cocktails that start with the letter M, declared a writer to watch by Kirkus and a busy engrossing new voice by Entertainment Weekly, her smart, funny contemporary romances include Too Good to Be Real and her award-winning Sometimes in Love debut series, Getting Hot with the Scott, which is a major reason you're here. I mean, how can I resist Scotland? <laughs> Once upon a bad boy. A former high school English and theater teacher, she spends her days in her Star Wars office dreaming up meat cutes. She lives in Chicagoland with her husband, their two redhead daughters, and one very large dog. <laughs> yes, very large dog named Francesca, who we call Francesca. Franny. 
<laughs> what what breed is Francesca? So she's a shelter dog, and they know that she's Catahoula and something else. They're not sure what. And Catahoulas were bred in Louisiana to herd pigs. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and apparently they can climb trees. <laughs> wow. Uh, Catahoula um, can climb trees. Catahoula, yeah. So she's, it's a cur. So she's got the cur, you know, kind of shaped, um, shaped head. And mm-hmm. she definitely loves to herd. She likes to, you know, make sure everyone's following in a line. And <laughs> It's so funny about breeds because I always had just the golden retrievers. I shouldn't say just, but I had two golden retrievers and they, of course, love to fetch balls. They'll fetch for an hour on end. Uh, So I didn't really realize how different each breed is, not completely. Mm -hmm. And so when I got her, the first time I tossed a stick, she looked at me like, well, I guess you're going to have to go get that now, aren't you? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's not a fetcher either. She's just, I mean, and yeah, you think dogs all do the same thing. Definitely not. They have their mm-hmm. own. Yeah. So each breed has their own thing. So, Michael, what is our first beer? Our first beer. So, with this first reading, the main <coughs> image that stuck with me, aside from seagull poop, which will become <laughs> clear in a moment, um, is, I hope that doesn't work into the beer, <laughs> is the sea. So, the sand on the beach, the, the, you know, that aromatic, if you want to call it that, salt water um, and the crashing waves. So just the sea, because it takes place on the beach. So I have a beer that I've actually poured on Books and Brews once before, long, long, long ago. Uh, from Dogfish Head in Delaware, I have Sea Quench Ale. Ooh. So this is, uh, color is, this is a Kolsch style ale. Uh, it's soured, then it's brewed with lime peel, lime juice, black limes, and sea salt. <laughs> um, it is super refreshing. Cool. You don't really taste the salt per se, um, but you do taste the sour and the limes for sure. Cheers. Cheers. Sorry, I've already been drinking. <laughs> yeah, it must be really good. You jumped the gun. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do like this one. I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of the, the the sour beers that are mostly made now, but I don't mind this one so much. Um, I, I actually kind of like this, and it makes me wonder, do you remember what my reaction was to it the last time you poured it, which has to be, what, a year and a half, two years ago or more? Yeah, it was at your house, one of the, one of the things was okay. at your house. That was um, really early. Uh, I do not remember. I think you liked it, actually. Okay. It would be really interesting to know, like, something that you served back in 2017 when we started that <laughs> maybe I appreciated it if bit by bit. You know, I'm liking more and more beers. Your taste uh, more, so Yeah. I do like that. That's, um, it is refreshing is a good word. It's got just a little bit of tartness to it. Yeah, it's not crazy sour like some of them are. No, no, not at all. Definitely all about lime, though. What? Definitely all about lime. <laughs> That's good. It's about lime, so it makes me think of vacation, yes? This would be a good sitting on the beach, sipping on vacation beer? Yeah, mm-hmm. it would probably also be. I, I'm just imagining, I hate tequila, and so this is not going to be a, a cocktail I would drink, but I can imagine this uh, mixed with tequila. Oh, well, with the lime, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm. I will be taking notes and getting all of these beers for myself later. <laughs> and and we'll my have it on the website too. too. Yeah, we'll have it all up on the website. So, are we ready for the first reading? Um, sure. Yes. So the the first the first reading is from my upcoming novel, which will release on July 6th. So perfect for the summertime. It is called Too Good to Be Real, and it is a romantic comedy. And um, I call this my love letter to romantic comedies because it really takes the iconic rom-coms of the late 90s and early zeros and hones in on, um, there's a lot of um, like, you know, Easter eggs. So if you've watch those movies and enjoyed those movies, you're going to recognize a lots of little things in there. So in this scene, we have um, Luke, the hero. It, you know, we have our heroine, heroine in, in romance. And he's, um, you know, kind of needing to work some things out. So he's going for a walk on the beach. And uh, here we go. So closing his eyes, Luke imagined his problems as a row of dominoes. If he lined them up, he could control how they fell one after another in tidy procession. Click, click, click. Eyes still closed, he kept walking. 
Over the past year, he'd been up and down this path hundreds of times. It was his favorite place on the whole resort. He could walk it blindfolded, backwards in his sleep. He inhaled the fresh lake breeze, a little calmer now. The dominoes tumbled more slowly. Click, click, click. Ouch! A voice, surprised and feminine, collided with Luke's thoughts as his shin made contact with something hard. What the... Mental domino scattered as Luke stumbled backwards, a warm, solid weight falling with him, landing on top of him in the sand. Oof. Had he made that sound? He opened his eyes, his view of the sky above marred by a tangle of bright hair. Not red, not blonde, not brown either, but some mix of all three. The strangely colored locks blowing across his face smelled rich and inviting, like that first breath of fresh brewed coffee when you step inside a cafe, and it was soft, so silky soft against his cheek. These details skipped across the surface of his thoughts in rapid succession, like pebbles skipping across a lake, leaving ripples in their wake. Just as things began to settle down, an elbow caught him square in the ribs and sent his thoughts flying again. Oof! This time, Luke was sure he'd been the one making that sound. The woman was struggling to get up, and as she tried to stand, she continued to poke and jab him in uncomfortable places. For someone who was so soft, she sure had a lot of sharp, pointy angles. Luke rolled sideways, depositing her in the sand next to him. He stood and offered her his hand. For a moment, she didn't move, glaring up at him through her veil of not red, not brown, not blonde hair. Then she huffed and grabbed onto his hand. If the brush of her hair on his cheek had been soft, the brush of her skin against his was softer still. He was still processing these sensory details when she pulled away from him and began shaking sand from her clothes. Do you always walk around with your eyes closed? Luke followed suit, brushing off his jeans. Only when I know I'm where I'm going. Her mouth dropped open, but no sound came out. She blinked at him. Like her hair, the color of her eyes was mercurial, hard to pin down. Green, brown, intelligent, wary. More pebbles skidded across his thoughts. Who was she? He'd never seen her on this beach before. Was she a guest at the resort? His brain whirred and he instinctively reached for his notebook, but it wasn't there. His back pocket was empty. He'd been holding it when he was walking, holding it when they collided. Luke turned, searching the path. A moment later, he spotted the gleam of the metal spiral in a flash of sunlight, and a moment after that, a seagull swooped down and snatched it up. Hey! Luke yelled, shaking his fist and running after the bird. Loops of the spiral clipped between its beak. The bird flapped its wings, propelling away from him. Give that back, you feathered felon! Um, I don't think he, the bird can speak English, the woman said from behind him, voice dry. And, if he was not mistaken, amused at him, because he was acting like an imbecile. Luke glared up at the bird, shaking his fist one more time. You better watch out, the woman warned, or that seagull is going to... Something wet and slimy splattered down the front of Luke's shirt. Poop on you, she finished. No, there was no mistaking it. She was definitely laughing at him. He scowled and dipped his chin, assessing the damage. A zigzag of bird crap decorated his chest. Awesome. And, oh God, the smell. What the heck had that bird been eating for its excrement to smell so bad? The woman wrinkled her nose. It's not me, Luke began. Well, it, it is me, it, but it's not. It, it's the bird. She took a step back. Shit, he finished weakly and attempted to maneuver out of his shirt. He refused to wear what was now basically a seagull diaper. The problem was that Luke also wanted to avoid making contents with the wretched contents of the flying jerk's rectum which meant he had to be strategic about where he touched the shirt and how he pulled it off. Do you want some help? The woman offered. Do you want to help? He asked, gripping the ends of his shirt between his fingertips and folding the worst of the damage over onto itself. Not really. Then why did you offer? Luke grunted, tugging the fabric over his head gingerly, stretching the collar so it didn't touch his face. Obligation, she said. Instinct, maybe. Luke tossed the shirt on the ground and stared down at her. Your instinct is to offer help you don't intend to give? She raised her chin to meet his gaze. I didn't say I wouldn't help, just that I didn't want to help. Luke bit his cheek. He could see why this sort of word game annoyed his sister. A gust of wind blew in from the lake and the woman's mouth quirked, her attention shifting to his chest. That's a stiff breeze, huh? 
heat flushed his skin and Luke fought the urge to cover himself. Stop looking at my nipples. Tall, lanky, and more than a tad on the pale side, he'd never been one of those walk around shirtless kind of dudes. He was a programmer for Christ's sake. Wow, you're grumpy. You would be too if some woman ran into you, an asshole bird stole your notebook before deciding to take a heinous smelling dump on you, and then the same woman who knocked you over is now standing there ogling your naked torso. I'm not ogling! Luke crossed his arms over his chest, forcing her gaze up to his. Okay, fine. Maybe I was ogling a little, she admitted, but it's not my fault. You're a giant and it's all like right there in front of me. How, how tall are you? She wondered. Six, four. He cocked his head. How short are you? Five, four. Luke narrowed his eyes. She blew out a breath and rolled her eyes. Okay, you got me. I'm five, three and three quarters. His gaze narrowed some more. Five, three and a half. Almost. He grinned. Whoever she was, he liked her. All five foot three and almost a half inches of her. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so that has to be unique being pooped on by a seagull. <laughs> <laughs> the cover has the seagulls. <laughs> In the world of uh, meads. Uh, just, I'm, I'm curious, do you see a difference between Easter eggs and tropes? Or are you using those words sort of interchangeably? Um, I definitely see a difference, definitely. Oh. So a trope is something that is universal. You will see it across genres, across um, stories, and used in wildly different ways. I think mm -hmm. an Easter egg is much more specific to oh. a particular piece of art. Um, a, sp a specific moment in a movie, a specific character okay. uh, line. So it's, yeah. What what would be an Easter egg your reader might find in this book? Um, so so there's some that are obvious, like the famous um, "I'll have what she's having" from uh, when Harry met Sally. <laughs> There's a scene in the book that that deals with that moment. Um, some are a little bit more subtle. The, the 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 format of the book itself is a bit of an Easter egg. Um, there's a movie called Austin Land, which is about a resort that people who love Jane Austen can go and pretend mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. living in that world. Mm -hmm. And for Too Good to Be Real, it is a resort that is for rom com lovers. So you go to this resort where you get to pretend. You are living in a rom-com movie. Like you get to have um, those experiences. And, and, yeah. and that too has to be unique. I've never quite heard of that setup. You are perfect <laughs> because you call yourself the Writing Lush and you actually run a program similar to ours, I think called, uh, is it called Boozy Book Broads? I do. I do. We have a monthly um, uh, chat that we do um, for the bookstore Love Sweet Arrow. And every month, uh, it's myself and two other romance authors who um, we get together and we talk about books and booze and we bring another author. We have invited another, not always an author, it could be someone from the publishing industry, but co they come on to chat with us about um, their newest release and what they've got going on. And we always have a signature cocktail for mm -hmm. that month. Uh, we just had um, Denny Bryce on last week, whose book is set um, in 1920 Chicago. So she uh -huh. had um, a French 75 cocktail, which is very popular oh. with, from that time period. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've had some fun with that with uh, Oscar Shaheen's book set in uh, was the 1600s, I think, in the Caribbean. We had some fun with that. Um, what does it mean to be a writing lush or a reading lush? <laughs> um, so it kind of came about by accident and became uh, my brand, not mm -hmm. on purpose. So um, writing, I think I made a joke at some point because I think what you know the whole like you know write drunk, edit sober, that whole situation. <laughs> love that. <laughs> and, Never um, I love it. <laughs> Um, and, and, and just like, so, f and, and, and lush, just like kind of embracing those things that you, that you like get pleasure from that you enjoy. And, and, and that is like reading a romance is in those ways kind of indulgent and in embracing the things that you find pleasurable and that you, that you enjoy. And mm -hmm. so a reading lush is like similar. So that, you know, someone who just kind of like embraces those things and is not afraid to be openly indulgent. Uh -huh. That's wonderful. <laughs> <There it goes. laughs> 
I can't, I hope, I'm hoping your dog makes the appearance. Um, I try and get my dog in here, but the quarters are kind of tight with the setup. So she'd knock everything over. <laughs> if you hear me suddenly scream, that's probably what happened. Um, we're ready for beer number two. And I think this is going to be the very unique one. Okay, ready for beer number two. No, I don't, no, this isn't the, this is, this isn't the that's the last. Oh, we're saving the best reading. for last. This but, is a treat coming up. If I'm not mistaken, the next reading is the, the Scotsman in the Wall. Yes, yeah. the Scotsman in the Wall. Just <laughs> <laughs> do these in the right order. And we don't <laughs> no sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, so this next one is a Scotsman in a Wall. <laughs> That's the name of the beer? Are you serious? What's that? Is that the name of the beer? No, no, no. But I, oh. you're going to have a big strapping Scotsman. Uh, then you have to have a big strapping Scottish beer. Perfect. Uh, I picked a strong Scottish ale, also known as a wee heavy. Uh, a wee heavy. I might have poured this on the, on the show too at some point. I don't. I don't recall this. I think I would have remembered. So this is Old Chub from Oscar Blues. You're gonna love this one, Laura. All right. So the uh, Scottish ales tend to be malt forward. Um, but they also tend to be fairly low alcohol, like all of the beers from uh, the British Isles, or from Great Britain, generally, that area. Uh, but the Wee Heavy is just as it sounds. It's a little bit stronger. <laughs> so they tend to be around 8% alcohol, uh, very rich, very malt forward. So caramel and dark fruits, and they're just lovely. So cheers. All right, cheers. As soon as you said we have heavy, um, the place I used to work at, they, they serve the we heavy. So mm -hmm. you said malt forward. Yes, very malty. Very, yeah. I, I, I you like this a lot. Oh, I knew you would. This is your kind of beer. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. You, you know what I like. Um, I've actually been drinking a lot of this sort lately because I've been, I've been working like 12, 13 hours on packing and organizing and sometimes water just gets a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I highly recommend this. And uh, are we ready for reading number two? Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. So this is a, this is a is a book set in Scotland. <laughs> uh, it start it starts in Scotland, and then they move to London, and then eventually get to Chicago. So they kind of you know do a bit of, of world tra traveling. Uh, the heroine is on vacation with her friends. They're on a tour of Edinburgh Castle, and they actually had just finished with a whiskey tasting at the castle and she needed to go find the restroom um, from all of the water she was chugging between the whiskey tastings and got herself lost on the way back. So she's a little tipsy, a little lost and she stumbles into this. She thinks she hears a sound in one of the rooms in the castle. And so she goes to check it out. So on a hunch, she crossed the room and ran her fingers slowly over the bookshelves. Nothing happened. What did you expect, Nancy Drew? She chided herself, a hidden spring revealing a secret passage. Who goes there? A hoarse Scottish burr rolled from behind the wall. Still gripping one of the shelves, Cassie stumbled sideways and the entire bookcase moved with her, sliding open like a door. Holy shit! For shame, lass, what a tongue you have, a husky voice growled. She peered around the edge of the bookcase. A man sat in the recessed space, one shoulder propped against the inner wall of what happened to be a passageway. His legs were sprawled in front of him, his bare legs. Would you look at that? The man is wearing a kilt. Note to self, Cassie Crow, be careful what you wish for. The man groaned again and raised a hand to shield his eyes from the sunlight now cutting across the hidden alcove. Are you all right? I will be fine once you dice that blasted light. He squinted up at her. Be ye a new chambermaid. Chambermaid? She eyed the wide sleeves and open neck of the old-fashioned piratey shirt he wore. Not sure what kind of stuff you're into, buddy, but I don't do RPG. Weird ass. His dark red brows drew together as he shaped his mouth around the letters. RPG? Role-playing games? You know, like cosplay or whatever. She pointed at him. Look, you're the one wearing that get up and talking like a reject from Macbeth. He narrowed his eyes at her finger. Be he a witch? What did you call me? With another groan, he lurched forward. Oh God, what if he was hurt? 
For all she knew, he was a member of some historic castle tour who got lost in a back passageway and hit his head. She leaned down to inspect him for bruises. He threw a hand out, palm up, warding her off. Back away, sorceress, he hissed. Seriously? She slapped his hand out of the way. Here, let me help you out of there. Cassie tugged gently on his shoulder. The voluminous shirt was loose, but she could feel and appreciate the thick spread of muscle beneath the soft fabric. Just my luck. I finally run into a hot Highlander, and he's delusional. The man waved off her assistance and struggled to his feet, shaking a wild tassel of thick red hair out of his eyes. Cassie never fancied herself to be a ginger girl, but it worked on him. Or maybe that was the kilt talking. She eyed the swath of plaid fabric around his hips and wondered, like most in her position would, what might or might not be under there. Reluctantly, she raised her gaze and caught him scrutinizing her in return. What be these strange reeks you wear? He asked, moving in a circle around her. Cassie swore she could feel the weight of each of his eyeballs resting on her denim-clad backside. Fair enough. After a prolonged moment, she glanced over her shoulder. Get a good look? Aye, he swallowed. Tis most unseemly, lass. He shook his head, gaze still glued to her ass. They're called jeans. She pivoted to face him. Are you for real? He met his gaze, his answer falling from his lips in a deep, rich brogue trilling with R's that curled her toes. Aye, lass, I'm real. Cassie's heart hiccuped. Of course he's real, unless those shots were stronger than I thought. Were you at the whiskey tasting? Whiskey? His green gold eyes lit with interest. Do you have whiskey for me then? I could use a wee dram. Be a good lass and fetch it for me. Ha! I think you've had enough, mister. Is that how you ended up stuck in there? Even as she said this, Cassie doubted it. She didn't smell a hint of alcohol on him, though she did pick up other pleasant smells, mint and clove and man and stop being ridiculous. His broad shoulders lifted and dropped. I didn't can. How long were you in there? Another shrug. Cassie dragged her attention away from the wide curve of his shoulders and leaned past him, inspecting the dark, narrow space behind the bookshelf. He grabbed her wrist and pulled her back, panic edging his voice. Nay, lass. Do not be going in there. Why not? She inched forward and tried to get a better look. It cannot be safe. He tugged on her wrist again, his fingers warm and firm. Tiny butterflies danced along the path where his skin touched hers. She brushed away the tingling sensation and slipped out of his grip, careful not to snag her bracelet. Well, you were in there, and you appear to have managed. Are you daft, wench? I was trapped. She sniffed, not sure she liked being called wench, and frowned up at him. What's the last thing you remember? He closed his eyes and slumped against the shelf. I cannot recall anything before the moment I woke to find myself crammed within yonder wall. He blinked and focused intently on her. The moment I found you, lass. Cassie decided she liked being called lass much better than wench, especially when he was looking at her like that. Gazes locked her other senses sharpened, heightening her awareness of his body and its proximity to hers. She cleared her throat. I think it'd be more accurate to say I'm the one who found you. For a moment, Cassie indulged in the fantasy that had been building in the back of her mind ever since she'd first discovered him. Looking at his big, kilted body, it was all too easy to cast him as a warrior from long ago, a Highland hero sent her forward in time to find his true love. But that was a plot of her favorite romance novels. Unfortunately, this was real life, and brawny, beautiful men in kilts did not magically appear from behind hidden walls. Fantastic. Uh, one of the reasons- Not a time travel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, disclaimer. Um, but- I actually read the excerpt on uh, on Amazon. It goes quite a bit beyond that. It's, it was fun to read. I especially liked your work, wanted to have you on the program because like mine, it's set in Scotland. So you've been to Scotland. How many times what brought you there? I have not. We were, we were supposed to go to Scotland um, and then 
we were supposed to actually go last summer. So I, I have spent a great deal of time researching Scotland, but I have not yet had the pleasure of getting to experience oh. it first person. But I've had a lot of people who've read this book and told me it made them feel like they were there. So. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You've been to Dublin and London. I've been to Dublin and London. Yes, I have. Okay. I've been to, um, and I've been like to surrounding areas around Dublin. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Some castles in that area. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that sort of part of what drew you to Scotland or what made you want to set a book in Scotland? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I fully admit to being someone who loves the Highlander romances. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I am a huge fan of, especially the time traveling Highland romances. I mean, obviously Outlander is the biggest, the one that everyone, you know, mm-hmm. usually recognizes. And there's a lot of affectionate winks, I like to say, to Outlander, um, but also to Karen Marie Monning, who had an entire series of like these time traveling Scottish druids. Um, mm-hmm. So I just, it's just something that I've always enjoyed. And you know, when I started writing this um, book, you know, I was just kind of just having fun. And it, you know, kind of writing in a sense that, oh, it could be a time travel. And then, of course, it turns out that he's, you know, having a bit of a joke, and he's, (laughs) he's playing a prank. So, you know, it's fun. Mm -hmm. As readers start this book, they're thick, they constantly say, I thought I was reading something else. And then surprise. Right. Well, which is appropriate because she herself is very surprised, you know, and I think she never quite believes it, but. (laughs) Well, it's one of those things where she's just tipsy enough and just hopeful enough. And the moment and this, you know, there's like this, this, this flash you have of what if, (laughs) like, what if this Scottish hunk fell out of the wall (laughs) from another century? Amazing. (laughs) Yeah, you know, when I read the excerpt online, I was struck by one line, and it wasn't in what you read, but just a little bit beyond that, I think. And uh, she says uh, she's been fantasizing for years about, you know, having this wild romance and playing with some exotic, you know, European Highland or whatever. And uh, so when she's here, the line is her brain just skips straight to the good stuff. And she realizes, like, wait a second, now I'm here. I don't actually know what to do. (laughs) And I was struck by that because I think it's, um, I almost wondered, were you kind of breaking a fourth wall a little bit? Were you poking fun at romance where I've never, I don't think, I mean, I don't read a lot of romance. I confess that I I read very little of it. Um, I haven't for years, but I've never seen someone like that (laughs) self-aware. Like, oh yeah. Um, Yeah. I think so there I think there's a I, like I talk about aff- affectionate wings and I think there is definitely a lot of um, like kind of these affectionate nods to the more ridiculous tropes in romance the more you know out there things that happen and having fun with it in a way that you know and there's a, a lot of you know and, and kind of diehard romance readers are very self-aware of the ridiculous levels of some of the things and the things that they enjoy and um we're we're, we embrace it though it's okay like you know there's I think there's there's bonkers things in any you know you know genre and um you know whether it be like uh, you know, the, the thrillers or the, the, the gladiator types of things with the, the war stories and any just, you know, kind of, so we call it like leaning in. So, you right. know, you lean in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the thrillers, it's the trombones come and play the eerie chords. And yet she goes down to the basement in her flimsy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you hear the trombones and the minor chords? Don't <laughs> And I think that was a good thing you picked up on because, you know, right. And, and honestly, like if you, you, you dream of a situation, but then what happens if you're actually tossed into that moment? Like, do you, like, you don't know what you're going to, you may have thought about it for years right. but like for it to actually happen. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I kind of joked with my writer's group one night. I'm like, I'm no good at this fantasizing because I have a writer's brain and I have to figure out, wait, how did I meet this guy? Where did I meet him? I have to lay the plot and it has to make sense. And like, <laughs> just do that because I've got a writer's brain like no no you have to write this like a story and it has to make sense so, but I, I did get a kick out of that line and I think that we are ready for beer number three already and this one I'm excited about is it would we even call it a beer Michael yeah it's beer, it's it's beer. beer. Okay. 
That's right. Right. So this is the unique we're referring to. Um, so this one, I, I was reading into this a little bit, but my my thinking was, or my sense was, that this is taking place at some sort of fancy cocktail party, not in the U.S. Um, and our heroine is an American. Um, I could be completely wrong about that, except that the heroine is American because that's specifically referred to. Uh, but her Americanness is called out. Uh, and so she seems out of place as an American in this more sophisticated uh, European setting. And so I decided we're going to, and she gets something spilled on her. So, <laughs> part of all sort. <laughs> um, so we're going to make a cocktail. So you know, with the a version of the Americano. So Americano is an Italian cocktail. It is equal parts Campari and sweet vermouth uh, with soda, club soda. But the beer Americano comes from a swanky cafe somewhere in Italy. Uh, and you just replace the club soda with a lager. So we're using Firestone Walker lager, which this is really just an American lager dressed up in a fancy can uh, from a fancy brewery. For some reason, a couple of years ago, the American breweries, the craft breweries decided to go against their founding of rebelling against crappy American lagers and start making crappy American lagers. <laughs> <laughs> so Wait. I'm gonna go there. So I'm gonna switch cameras here to the cocktail cam. Uh, I love that you have a cocktail cam. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Here. So we start with a classic Collins glass. We're going to fill that with some ice. I should be using a tongue, but you know, who cares? Um, then I've got an ounce and a half of Campari and an ounce and a half of sweet vermouth. So I'm going to toss that in there. Then we're going to pour some uh, beer into this little cup here. And then we're going to use one of these fancy, like handy, like handheld milk frothers. And we're going to froth that beer up. Get it so it's mostly foam. How much beer should I have put in here? I don't know, some. Some. <laughs> just, just like uh, my right, cooking with Sean. So this is an Italian uh, beer Americano? This off with that beer foam. Oh, look how fancy that looks. <laughs> and garnish with an orange peel. So we'll twist that orange peel on top of there, stick it in, and there you go. <laughs> I love that it's a beer cocktail. That is awesome. Now, I like to mix these up because uh, you'll see the beer sort of floats on top. Yeah, there's like, there's, it's like suspension. You can see the different colors almost. Yeah, so typically I like to mix these up because I like it all blended together. Um, oh, okay. It's lovely that way with the, with the beer floating on okay. top. Uh, I just couldn't get mine to stay frothy no matter what I did. It's not going to stay frothy very long. It's American lager. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to mix this up because I want all of the stuff together. But I wanted you to see how the, the beer floats on top. Okay. My, my orange peel just doesn't look as good as yours. In fact... <laughs> I make a lot of cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put two orange peels right. to see if that balances it out. Here's mine. That is, I, this is super fancy. I'm going to have to have these at like my next like book club party. <laughs> I like that. So there's an even better version of this that I like better. Uh, from that same Italian cafe, it's called the Wheat Beer Americano. So it uses uh, uh, German style wheat beer, a Hefeweizen. And I would like that better. I love that <laughs> Substitute dry vermouth for the sweet vermouth and use a lemon peel garnish. Ooh, well, that would make sense with the heffy, yeah. Yeah, I like that even better than the straight up beer Americano, but this is really good too. It's a great summer cocktail. I mean, this is so summery. 
I am going to totally make that. And I'll have to look up the Heffy one too, because um, I'm not much for lagers, but I love Hefeweizen. So, yeah. It's really easy. Equal parts, <clears throat> uh, Campari and vermouth, and top off with beer. Fancy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, right. so this actually, um, it does, it takes place um, at the Navy Pier um, Shakespeare uh, Theater. So it is in America, but it is a very fancy event and she does feel a bit out of place. <laughs> so you got it. And he's, he's over from, he's, he's across, across the pond. So he's definitely the Brit in the title, smitten by the Brit. <laughs> Um, and it's funny because uh, the Shakespeare Theater on Navy Pier is going to be putting on a special event at the end of this week, um, a virtual event because they can't do things in person right now. But this is like a Shakespeare's birthday is coming up the end of April and they always do special events. So this is a costume party in honor of Shakespeare's birthday. <laughs> That's why she's dressed up with the flowers in her hair. <laughs> right. Should I go for it? Yep, go ahead. All right, so smitten by the Brits. So before she found herself in double toil and trouble, Bonnie washed her hands and made a hasty exit. She hurried through the restroom door, careening straight into a solid wall of suit covered muscle. Woof, she ex exhaled, stumbling as her floral crown flipped, flopped down over her eyes and icy liquid splashed across her chest. Sorry, a smooth, veil, a smooth male voice apologized, his British accent slicing the R's into a crisp D sound. Bonnie froze. She recognized that voice, knew that posh British accent. Heart beating faster, Bonnie lifted her chin, trying to peek through the tangle of flowers currently blinding her. Warm fingers brushed her forehead, and a moment later she could see, straight into a pair of familiar blue eyes, fringed with sinfully long sooty lashes. Theo, she sputtered. What are you doing here? At this moment? He set his now empty glass on a passing server's tray and reached up to adjust her crown, gently freeing a flower and snarled in a mass of curls, assisting you. Theo grinned, twin dimples appearing in his cheeks. A fluttering sensation tickled the backs of her knees, and she swayed. Are you quite all right? He asked, holding her by the shoulders and steadying her. Me? I'm fine, totally fine, she babbled, wishing she had gone home when she'd had the chance. Why hadn't Cassie mentioned Theo was coming tonight? She had to know he would be here. Logan was his best friend. In fact, it was through Logan that Bonnie had met Theo in the first place while in London last summer on a supper cruise along the Thames. It was a meeting she was unlikely to forget, even though she'd been trying very hard to do just that ever since. Tall, dark, and handsome, not to mention that accent, Theo embodied every Austin hero Bonnie had ever crushed on, and she'd crushed on several. Meanwhile, her friend Anna, who'd also been on the supper cruise that night on the Thames, had christened Theo Prince Eric. It was an apt moniker. With his cap of thick black hair, soulful blue eyes, and easy smile, the Brit did look like the cartoon prince come to life. Who are you supposed to be? Bonnie took a closer look at the get-up Theo was wearing. Theo was presently sporting and smiled. Maybe he wasn't a prince, but he looked like someone noble. A duke? He breathed in sharply. Pardon? Your costume, she gestured at the formal sash and medallion decorating his chest. I'm guessing Orsino, maybe. From Twelfth Night? Oh, right. Orsino. Exactly. He exhaled, shoulders visibly relaxing beneath the tailored cut of his coat. If music be the food of love, play on, she finished the line, beaming up at him. Their eyes met, and just as she had last summer... Bonnie felt an irresistible pull. Well, not literally irresistible. She had managed to resist him after all. Faithful to her fiance, Bonnie might not be able to co control how her body reacted to the dashing Brit, but she could control what she did about it, which was nothing. She pulled back, breaking their gaze and pushing another wayward curl out of her face. Can you guess who I am? Hmm, he murmured, I'd wager on Ophelia. He looked her over slowly from floral crowned head to slippered feet, going for the Malay version, I see. Very good. He knew Malay? Impressive, cute, and smart. Oh, her willpower was going to get a workout tonight. You like Malay's work? He pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and offered it to her. No, I love his work, and Waterhouse, too. She sighed and accepted the handkerchief, dabbing at the alcohol soaking the bodice of her dress. 
A memory flashed through her. I once tried to recreate his painting of the Lady of Shalott. You paint? No, she laughed. Well, not well, anyway. I acted it out. I'd read about a girl doing that in a book and wanted to give it a try. It wasn't the first nor the last time Bonnie tried to copy a scene from Anne of Green Gables. She believed Anne Shirley to be her literary doppelganger and cast her best friend Cassie as, as, as Anne's bosom buddy, Diana Barry. Luckily, unlike the boat Anne borrows from Diana in the book, the inflatable raft Bonnie borrowed from Cassie hadn't sprung a leak. Theo shook his head. What is it with you and watery tarts? Are you quoting Monty Python at me? He pulled a serious face. I'm simply concerned about your apparent obsession with strange women lying in ponds. She tittered. Oh God, she actually tittered. Bonnie winced. She dropped her gaze and dabbed harder at the dark stains spreading across the front of her dress. The painting is so beautiful, so ethereal. Even a copy of it in a book brings the magic of Tennyson's poem to life. I wanted to live that magic. She was rambling and couldn't seem to stop. Her brain went on sabbatical whenever the Brit was near. That's it, Ophelia. Time to get thee to a nunnery. They are beautiful, he murmured. She glanced up to find him staring at her chest. Excuse me? Bonnie stopped dabbing. Was he talking about her breasts? Did you see them at the tape? His blue eyes met hers. Cold black brows arched with polite curiosity. When you were in London last summer. The paintings, right. She shook her head. We did the Victoria and Albert Museum instead. Shame. He sounded truly disappointed. There's another Malay at the Tate of a different Tennyson poem based on one of Shakespeare's comedies. Do you know the one I mean? Please, she scoffed. Is this a quiz? Mariana from Measure for Measure. She handed him back his handkerchief, now a little worse for wear, though I could never think of that play as a comedy. The lady knows Shakespeare, poets, painters, and even Monty Python. He blew a soft whistle. My, you are quite cultured for an American. A hum of awareness threaded through her and she tamped it down. Are you complimenting me or insulting my country? He didn't reply, but the corners of his mouth curled with amusement, one dimple coming out to play. The backs of her knees immediately began to tip to prickle again. Damn it. Why couldn't the Brit have stayed on his side of the pond? Da, da, da. I hit mute because <laughs> my musical clock is about to go off and I, I hoped okay. I heard it and let it go off while you were still reading, but it's going to go off while I'm talking. Um, so one of the things I love about this scene is how we see all these paintings, these poetries, these plays, all these artists working off one another inspired by each other and I kind of thought it goes back to what I was talking about earlier that this man who wrote the poem the reaper man inspired me to write a piece of music which then you know I went and played in Scotland at Hermitage Castle which has quite a reputation <laughs> what struck me about this too was your series sometimes in love I think it revolves around is it five friends mm -hmm. okay and so we're going to see all five of them come back in these different books. And Bonnie, is she a professor of English? She is a professor of English literature, if you could not tell. <laughs> yes. Right, right. If you couldn't tell, I mean, hey, maybe she just loves it. But um, you taught high school English and theater and you directed plays, which I thought was kind of cool because my daughter-in-law does the exact same thing. Um, but... I was wondering, you know, here she is. She loves the great writers. She loves Shakespeare, Austin. Do you think that of all these women, she's the most like you? Oh, yeah. There's no question. <laughs> there's no question that there's a whole lot of Bonnie. Um, you know, you it, it happens You where you little pieces of yourself will slip into all your various characters. But there there is there is a lot of me in Bonnie. And yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, what, what yeah. about the rest? I mean, this is something I get asked, like, particularly because there's sort of two main female protagonists in my book. There's uh, Christina and there's Amy. And people want to decide which of them is more me. And they all, <laughs> I think they invariably get it wrong. Um, what about the rest of your characters? Do you find that quite a bit of you goes into them, too, or is it a whole lot less? 
Um, it depends. I think what's interesting, because like in the first book, it's actually the hero, the hero, the Scott, who um, um, he lost his father. And there is a, I kind of like unpacked my grief over losing my dad through the way he deals with his grief um, in that story. So there it, it like it's stuff. It's not like you plan it. You're like, I'm going to take this piece of me and put it into the book. It just sort of kind of unravels itself yeah, into sure. the story. And Bonnie always was on the page as this English professor, as this lover of Shakespeare and Austin and whatnot. And, um, you know, being that kind of parallel to my own interests, things did start to weave together. But it's like, I think with each character, it's not just myself that I will see reflections of. There's everyone who's ever touched my life that, you know, and it's not like it's always conscious, but I will see little like personality quirks of my closest friends popping up (laughs) into these characters. Um, Yeah, and I think that's so true. Like I've got a character and she's really a very, very minor character, but I I thought, yeah, there's part of me and my character, Sean, who's just this horrible, awful playboy. I'm like, he is nothing like me. And yet if you dig deep enough, there are parts Mm -hmm. of me directly from Mm -hmm. a minor character named Joan back in medieval Scotland. And she is, I'm not going to say who publicly, but um, she is a part of working out my feelings about somebody I know who just (laughs) talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and complains endlessly in heavy sighs. And this is somebody who drives me nuts and it's really broken the relationship. And yet by writing Joan, you know, there's also this sense of compassion for where does someone like that come from? That's you such know? a great point to like see the other side of like by having to create this person as a fully developed character, it gives them angles that they're not just a two dimensional villain or dislikable right. person. Yeah. I think that's why there is so, so much therapy in writing. <laughs> yes. Close to running out of time, but as fast as you can, you have done really well in just two years since your books were published. How did you do it? Um, I don't, I, you just kind of, well, what happened with the first three books, it was very, my, my, my first, my, my debut deal, um, they decided they wanted to publish me very rapidly. So St. Martin's Press published three of my books in 2019. Mm -hmm. A month apart so april may and june so i had from i went from no books out to three books on the shelf which mm-hmm. was wild <laughs> and there's a lot i could spend hours talking about the pluses and minuses to that in traditional publishing um but then it's kind of like you go from that start to like making it continue and so right. you know having been moving from mass market paperback to now this will be trade paperback and mm-hmm. so you know we'll see we'll see what happens with that and um um, I just I think the biggest thing has been learning how to balance everything and yeah. and whatever balance I found was of course thrown off when we had COVID hit. <laughs> right, right. Um, so uh, I, if I had to like leave you with one thing, it's a, a writer's community. So it's my community mm-hmm. of writers that I connect with on a daily basis um, that helps keep me going and helps you know provide that inspiration. Um, and doing things like this with people like you, I um, mean, right. getting to connect with other you know people who are interested in connecting with books and connecting with readers so thank you so much for having me today so we are at i don't want to say at the end of our rope we're at the end of our time (laughs) (laughs) and if we were we're happily drinking (laughs) i need to ask you laura how would you like this cocktail i absolutely love this oh Yeah, yeah, I, you know, you've probably put me on a very bad path for the day. (laughs) I'm steering you away from Long Island iced tea. (laughs) Right, the Long Island iced teas are the reason I can't wear my wedding rings on the correct finger. (laughs) Although I blame that on COVID too, because it killed my throat teaching on Skype, and that's actually why I was drinking them. It it was for medicinal purposes. Can you give our links really quick? Uh, yes, uh, we are at aperfectpint.net is where the uh, podcast goes up. We are at a perfect pint on. I, I think that's socials. you, not us. What? That's you, not us. Oh no, that is me. Sorry. <laughs> we have cocktails before noon. <laughs> we are. <laughs> we. You're all a bunch of luscious. (laughs) And happy, happy to admit it. And book book mm brews on Instagram. Uh, We were at Books and Brews with Laura Bosica and Michael Agnew on Facebook. Facebook. 
Um, I am at aperfectpint.net and aperfectpint. Laura, where are you? I am at lauravosika.com, spelled V as in Victor, O-S-I-K-A. It's a bohemian name in case anyone's wondering. Uh, I believe it's bluebellschronicles.com will also get you there. And uh, Melanie, where are you? I'm easy to find thanks to my mom spelling my name weird. So anywhere you Google <laughs> Melanie, M-E-L-O-N-I-E Johnson, you'll pretty much find me or a casino owner. So if it's I'm not the casino owner, <laughs> I'm the romance <laughs> author. <laughs> All right, big difference. So come you, okay, and on. Laura, I just want to put out there, Laura will be putting the cocktail cam uh, on our Facebook or on our uh, YouTube. YouTube page. So I'll share that. I'm going to share that with my reading lesson. Made, go to the YouTube page, and the cocktail yep. cam will be there. And Who do we have next next month. Uh, next month we have Eugenia Thane, a poet. She is an author of poetry and prose. She is also a songwriter and available on Amazon and Spotify. Eugenia has 40 years of experience in writing. She is a preschool teacher and tutor. She is an international author published here and abroad, featured in several anthologies, online, in print, ebook, and audiobook form. She has no children of her own, but lives in Columbia, South Carolina with her husband, Ivan, and her tabby cat, Buddy. So complete shift. Yep. Looking forward to that. Uh, Melanie, I want to thank you for joining us here. You have been such an animated reader. This has been really fun. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. And uh, this has been Brooks and Books. Books and Cocktails Before Noon. Books and Brews, episode number 20. It has to be a really good cocktail. Cheers. <laughs>